I'm Kay Bess, and this is The Beehive. Women in voiceover, the voices of the fairer sex that keep the wheels of commerce and creativity moving in this country. Voices you hear every day, but names you likely don't know until now. Hey everybody, welcome to the inaugural podcast from The Beehive, where we talk with women in voiceover. What better way to start this podcast than with Wonder Woman herself, Rachel Kimsey. Rachel is probably best known for playing Wonder Woman on Justice League Action, which is airing on the Cartoon Network. She plays Rachel Kane on the hugely popular Call of Duty Black Ops 3 video game. And Jewels in Hullabaloo, it's a series of hand-animated shorts that have been financed by a hugely successful Indiegogo campaign, which we will come back and talk about. But welcome to the Beehive, Rachel. Thank you so much. I would love for you to tell me how you got into voiceover, by what avenue, because we know there are many. I have the the great... I fell into it on accident story. Okay. Uh, I was a young actor in New York and I was on a commercial audition and I guess they were auditioning the voiceover for another commercial next door and they said, Hey, can you come over and read this thing? (laughs) So uh, my first audition ever, I booked a Kodak campaign and I was like, for the voiceover, for the voiceover. I did not book the on-camera commercial. I don't remember what it was for. And I was like, oh, well, this, this voiceover thing is nice. It's just, it's just talking. Like, yeah. okay. And for years, I sort of treated it that way as this, this thing I did sometimes in the background when an opportunity came up. And it was several years in before I started taking it seriously as its own thing because mm-hmm. I was just enjoying it when it came along. Yeah. And that's when everything changed forever for me. Did that take place when you were in New York or when you were in L.A.? That was when I was in L.A. I'd been in L.A. for uh, a number of years at that point. What brought you here? (laughs) Uh, There are a lot of points in my life that sort of (laughs) happened as a happy accident. Um, I was doing stunt work on Ah. um, Spider-Man 2, and I came out to L.A. to be available for whenever they called me, and slept on a friend's couch for a month and a half while I was doing that, and then... Uh, a boyfriend came out here with a reality show he was producing. So I was like, well, I'll just stay here. And then we broke up. So I was like, well, I will still stay here for a while. <laughs> um, booked a little reality show that put me up in a hotel for a month. And I thought, well, this is kind of nice. What if I just stay in L.A.? And so I shipped all my things out from New York and wow. stayed here. I mean, it was I never really meant to move here, so I'm not exactly sure when... My LA journey started, but um, it's. Do you remember what sort of what year that was? I don't. I know that it's been over ten years okay. since Spider Man Two came out. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> since I've be been here there. at least ten years. Yeah. But I'm I'm I I was that person that kept saying I've been here for about two years, and then a friend was like, "Well, we've known each other for six years, so you've been here longer, longer. than that yeah. now." Yeah. I was like, "Oh, okay." I know time, <laughs> man. For all intents and purposes, you you came to voiceover through acting. Absolutely. And where do you find that your voiceover work is focused? We know that there are several areas in voiceover, animation, gaming, commercial, promo, all that stuff. Do you find that you're, that you gravitate toward one particular area of voiceover more? I've noticed that over the course of my career, it's, it's slowly shifted for several years. My best pocket was, uh, partner read commercials. And now it makes perfect sense to me. I was like, oh, I'm used to being an actor that interacts with other people. Yeah. So the stuff that came out the most naturally was when I was interacting with other people. Over years of practicing that, I started doing more commercial work where I wasn't with other people because I was finally comfortable in that world. Um, currently, I'm doing tons of interactive and gaming. And now with my cartoon taking off, that's been a big focus. And I'm doing more and more of that. But it's been this kind of slow evolution, this journey from 
uh, radio commercials to TV commercials to promo and narration and now interactive and gaming. And it's, I think one of the cool challenges of being a voice artist is that they're not the same. And so checking in with that recalibration in your head where I'm like, okay, well, I haven't done a commercial in a little bit. So let me check in with what, where, where am I calibrated now so that I can shift that back and making myself available to more than one pocket at a time. Um, and that's the fun intellectual challenge. I think of it is giving yourself the gift of, let me treat this as art and science. That's such a good word to use to recalibrate to Mm -hmm. whatever, uh, whatever area of voice over you. I mean, I, sometimes, I don't know if you have this experience, but every once in a while I'll get a, a piece of copy and they ask me to do something that I essentially have spent the last 20 years doing, but because I haven't read something like that in six months or so, and I'm like, wow, I, I don't even know how to do this anymore yeah. because my head is on a game. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it, it is so different mm-hmm. that it, when somebody just says, well, we just want it kind of, real and natural and you're like but this is a promo like how do I do that I mean, it's just so weird and then you remember you you do have to recalibrate yeah. and remember all the tips yeah. and tricks of that particular area one of my dirty secrets is that I um I've saved every audition I've ever done from home ever 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 well from I home since I started auditioning for, well that's probably much easier on my hard drive <laughs> if I was better about that yeah but there are times where I'll go back and I'm like what was that audition I did for that thing because they loved that and where's the sample I have of that I'm like okay that's what that sounds like that's what that feels like in my body okay but it's but it really is it's learning how to listen all over again because it's also evolved the the industry itself and what people are looking for has evolved from the time that I started to now and promo doesn't sound the way that it sounded 10 years ago and commercial doesn't sound the way that it sounded three years ago and and animation doesn't sound the way that cartoons sounded when I was a kid watching cartoons these these things keep shifting and so you've also got to stay flexible and and available to listening to what is happening now yeah I think that also helps actors find their place I mean I never auditioned for animated stuff 10, 15, 20 years ago, because I'm like the queen of understated. <laughs> and that's not what cartoons were yeah, 20 yeah. years ago. And so so now I get auditions that say, we don't want this to be bigger than life. We want it right. to sound natural. And all of a sudden, I'm reading on cartoons, which mm-hmm. I, you know. And so that is, that's an interesting piece to watch the trend yeah. change. And uh, I was thinking about the campaign for Southwest Airlines, which I believe it's still the same woman as a few years ago when they switched up their campaign uh-huh. and hired a woman. They uh-huh. went from, you know, you, you are now free to move about the cabin. They went from that to this, to a female branded voice. Mm-hmm. And I remember hearing, hearing this read for the first time. And I thought, oh, I, what was that? Like what? Like <laughs> I, it, it was really different and yeah. really um, kind of, what I at the time would have classified as being kind of abrasive, right? Oh, yeah. And I was like, I don't get why they would, why an airline. And then after a few more listens, and I, because I thought, she's not hitting the copy points and that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I, after a few listens, I thought, no, no, she is. And it's a really interesting read. Yeah. And, and then, then you listen. And then in a month, I was like, that, what a great campaign, mm-hmm. you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's little markers like that that, mm-hmm. that make you realize that voiceover and advertising and stuff, it's constantly moving in this direction or switching yeah. directions. It's, all, it's always moving. But the through line is that she did hit all the copy points, that mm-hmm. all of those things still matter, yeah. but she happened to approach them in a way that was just new, yeah. you know, different sounding. You well, know? that's one of the things that I love about voiceover. I, I was never <laughs> successful as an on-camera commercial actor. I had a a couple of commercials in a decade and I didn't enjoy the experience of you got to look right. You got to, you know, in 15 seconds or less, we have to know exactly who you are. Like there's some people who have that look and have that spirit. And I, I just don't. Whereas somehow in voiceover commercials, I love the game of let me figure out how to make you feel like I am the person who wants this information from you. The the one that always jumps out to me is I remember, and I don't even know how long it's been now. It's probably been over 10 years. Um, Queen Latifah doing, I believe it was a Pizza Hut ad. Oh. And I remember watching and I was like, I feel like Queen Latifah is sitting next to me on the couch 
telling me about this. How did she do that? Yeah. It doesn't sound, it doesn't feel like it's coming out of the TV at me. I feel like she's sitting right With next me. to me. Which is just what you want, and, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it, But it was this light bulb moment because it sounded so different from everything else. And I was like, I don't feel like someone's selling something to me. I just feel like I'm sharing this experience with somebody. And to me, that's what makes uh, commercial VO so fun. I'm like, yes. how, do I, how do I be a person in your life? And I love that game. And isn't that the most common direction? Especially now. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we, we don't talk at me. Yeah. You know, you're in the room, you're talking to your friends, you're, you know, and it's true. You just want to have the Friendly, sense that you're relatable, conversational, <laughs> all that, <laughs> you know, but there is a sense of like, you know, this is, I think this is what is meant when they say, you know, talk to one person. Yeah. Talk yeah. to one person. Walk me through your day, a typical working day. Cause we know there are days where it's like, I don't have anything on my schedule. Sure. We don't need that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting is that my typical working day changed a lot about a year ago when I realized that I was still doing that thing where I was holding on to, to day job jobs um, with that kind of like, but what if everything falls apart feeling? Um, and when I realized that I could let those things go to free up the mental energy and the mental space that I needed, suddenly all of those financial gaps were filled in with more work and more opportunities. And my quality of life improved immensely. And it took a long time to get to the place where I had that. I, you know, I want to make that clear. It's not like I booked my first commercial and was like, quitting my day job. Yeah. But the thing that's amazing now is now I do things like I prioritize my sleep because my body doesn't feel right. And my voice doesn't feel right. And my sinuses get congested if I don't get enough sleep. So the first thing I do is I prioritize sleep and I sleep well. And then a lot of times if I'll have an early morning session, the first thing is, you know, warm glass of water with lemon juice and a little sprinkle of salt and then probably three too many cups of coffee. Um, <laughs> and so I was doing um, a video game. I had a 9 a.m. session the other day and all the way driving to that session, it was my Pandora show tunes radio station uh, where I'm singing all the show tunes that I know all the words to and feeling where in my voice is warm and where is cold and where is my resonance sitting today and what do I need to do um, on the list of absurd things. Um, I've developed a, <laughs> this is so embarrassing, I've developed a sit-up routine in the morning because I, I've discovered if I don't do it, the muscles in my, my stomach and my diaphragm sometimes take a long time to wake up and, and like show up to the party to support uh -huh. my voice. Yeah. So I was like, well, let me just take that off the table. So I'm like doing my, my like sit ups and my V ups and my bicycles to like awesome. wake up those muscles Yeah. because a lot of my stuff is, is more deep and more resonant and more supported. And then I'll start checking, you know, what, what material is coming in. I've got a couple of, um, long-term clients that I'll, I'll work with, you know, once or twice a week or every couple of weeks. And that stuff will usually come in with like an hour or two's notice. And so right. are those things coming in and, and you're doing that stuff from home. Yeah. Doing this from home, which is great. It's and this incredible amount of freedom that again, I had to, I did do a lot of work to be able to build a booth in a studio that was quiet enough and, yeah. and, you know, ready enough to, to do that. But now I can, which is incredible. And then it's around like three to five o'clock that start getting, you know, all the stuff that's going to be due the next day or, or the next two days in. And I hate leaving it till the end of the night. And so I'll, every time one comes in, I'll, I'll run into the booth and, and do my couple of takes and, <clears throat> and then come out and, and get back to my day and then run in and do a couple of takes. And the biggest sense of freedom that's given me is that then I don't feel like I have to send it immediately. I can come back and listen right. to it again and, yeah. and decide if I'm happy with it. I don't have to be the director and the editor and the actor all at once. I can kind of go do the thing and then go, you know, make dinner or do a quick run to the grocery store and then come back and listen to it and go, yeah, that's what I wanted. Or no, let me, I'm hearing it differently now so I can do it again. Um, and then, you know, sending those things at night and getting ready for the next day. If it's a Friday, I might be going in to do my cartoon 
If it's a Wednesday, I might be going in to do ADR. When you say going in, that means you're going to another studio. You're not doing it. So you're working outside of your home studio on a cartoon, which I think is, that's kind of the deal. Why you need to be in LA for cartoons and animation. Yeah. And, and I think it really is. I mean, there are of course exceptions to everything, but for animation, especially you need to be in LA. Yeah. I have friends in New York who are like, how do I break into that? I was like, move Move back to LA LA because it's happening here. And there are some people that will call in on an ISDN to, to do their role for our show, but they're movie stars. I was just going to say, but so, they have some kind of clout going on. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and if it's somebody who's been with us for a long time, that they're away working on something. We had a guy who was on an, an HBO show for six months. And so, of course, he's going to call in from there and we're going to keep him as a, right. we as if I have anything to do with it. <laughs> um, you know, he stayed on. But as soon as he was done with that show, he came back to L.A. and was back in session with us. We're right. super lucky on Justice League Action that we get to record together. Yes. And they do their best to get as many of us in the room at the same time. Not all cartoons are like that. A lot of them you're recording solo, but ours, we're really lucky to be able to record together. And they work really hard to, to make that possible. So you got to be here. Yeah. This is the town for that. Yeah. Who's the director on that? Wes Gleason. Wes Gleason. And he yeah. is amazing. That's great. He's re- he's taught me such a great lesson about take yes for an answer, which I think is a really good life lesson in general that like there comes that moment where like you want to get it perfect and you want to nail it down. And you're like, this isn't mine. It's yours. You are the director of this episode. This is your episode. If you tell me that you like it, I trust you and I believe you. Yes. And when I see it back, I'm like, oh yeah, look, you were right. There it is. You are correct, sir. Good job. He's wonderful. He's just a doll as a human being too. Love him. What would you say up to this point is the best voiceover job you've ever had? Where you go, oh, I, can't, I just can't believe how lucky I, mean, I am that I did that. I'm so lucky that I have that job right now. I I mean, I was the little girl in Wonder Woman Under Ruse. <laughs> I, you know, I like I, I played, I learned how to spin in heels because clearly learning how to spin around in heels is a skill that an adult woman needs to yeah, have. Like if you're going to be Wonder Woman. And, and oh. not only that, I was so extraordinarily lucky that it's my first cartoon. Wow. I mean, that's fantastic. I've been an actor for over 20 years, but my first cartoon is a legacy role. And not only that is the character that was my iconic character. I'm so incredibly lucky. And every second that I get to do it feels like this incredible gift. I mean, I've done some things that I'm so proud of that I'm having such a good time on, but there's this feeling of no matter what, you can never take away from me that I got to be Wonder Woman. And it's amazing. And it's the coolest club to be in too. Like the women who've done it, are, are, are friends and heroes of mine. They're people yeah. that I so admire. I just feel so lucky to be a part of that group. I'm like, oh, I'm on that list. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people. That's pretty fantastic. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. So given that that's your first animated series, your first role, big, I mean, and it's the biggest role, What's your dream job? Because even though, like, you know, we have some dreams that come true, but that doesn't keep us from dreaming about other other things, right? Sure. So I'm just curious if you look now and say, from this vantage point now, even with this dream role that you yeah. are participating in, what other dreams do you have? It's all so much fun that there are very few things that I'm like, meh. Um, I, I want to, I'd love to do an animated feature because my understanding of it is that it's, it's just a different enough process that that would be really exciting to tackle. But also, I mean, it would be a lie to pretend like being a part of something that exists forever as it stands in its own form would be so incredible. I'm not necessarily the best, but God, would I love to sing in something? Ah, I would, it would be that's great. like, it, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, if they'd let me, it would be so would exciting. Like it would yeah. just be because who wasn't the kid that was, you know, walking around singing the song from yeah. the, you know, I had the 101 Dalmatians record mm-hmm. and the record in the eighties was all of the, it was all the story. It was yes. all the VO yeah, had, and all the, and it was so great. Yeah. And, and I remember when I think it's, I don't know which side it's on, but 
the car crash of Corella yes. Deville going off the cliff. Yes, right. Like, oh, it sounded so scary and it was so vivid and yeah. Oh. And you didn't. And like the animation of that movie is so beautiful, but like you didn't need it to be in the story. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. to be able to be a part of that would be so thrilling, especially because now it's one of the places that. They're actually creating original stories. Right. You know, a movie yeah. like, say, Zootopia that doesn't come from a fairy tale or Moana, which is, you right. know, a story that has these deep, rich foundations, but it wasn't in the books that I, you know, right. flipped through as a kid. Like, to be a part of opening up doors, um, there's something about being a part of a child's life that's just so special yeah. and opening up doors to new ideas and new perspectives and new ways of being empathetic to the world. Like that's super exciting. And the thought of being, I mean, the thought of being in a movie like um, cars or, or, um, yeah. or finding Nemo, which I think too. And uh, th- these were when my daughter was little, so they're, mm-hmm. they're markers for sure. me. But, and I've seen them each a thousand <laughs> times, but they're so funny. And they're yeah. so the the which is what was great about Looney Tunes and yeah. Warner Brothers cartoons because there's so much of it was adult humor, um, and and it's the same with those. And they're just I don't know, great great stories. Yeah. It's true that are original. And what kind of odd jobs did you do? Ha- have oh you gosh. done while you're you know while, while you've worked toward voiceover and acting as a? I am that notorious actor. person that always had four to seven jobs at any given time, <laughs> and that's literal. That's not trying to help it up. Um, so the jobs I retired from last year, I was a personal trainer. I was a CrossFit coach. I was a weightlifting coach and I was a yoga instructor. Um, those are just the four jobs I finally retired from a year ago. Okay. (laughs) I Um, saw your yoga videos. I was, it was very impressive. Thanks. Um, I've, I've always been a teacher. I'm sorry. In that list, did you just say acting coach? Are you still act? Are you still coaching? So the, the, I'll put them in quotation marks. The the day job stuff that I held on to was um, I'm still an acting teacher. I teach uh, regular classes and I also coach. Um, and I I so struggle with um, imposter syndrome, but I'm I'm coaching voiceover as well. It's that feeling of like, but I know who my teachers are, and so what's my voice? But I've always been a teacher, and yeah, and yeah. and I have had some some beautiful journeys with with some students in that. So I've I've continued doing those things because the mind space that it freed up letting go of my fitness career. Yeah. Now the emotional energy that I spend with my students still helps my career and still helps me yes. be present and an artist. So I've yeah. held those things, but I mean, I taught SAT classes. I taught SA, uh, ACT prep. I, I, when I was in New York, I tutored kids on the Regents exams. I tempt, I worked for the NFL for a while in the office <laughs> and they loved me because I never knew who any of the football players calling in were. So I'd be like, that's Don Van McNabb on the phone. I'm like, do you know what that is? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> but he's really nice. So I'm forwarding him to you. Um, yeah. I mean, I, there's something very refreshing about that. Like, I, I got the impression that they liked it. And you are <laughs> right. Can I help you, sir? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Those are great. That's yeah. quite a lot of odd, weird. They're not weird jobs. They're just interesting jobs to engage in as you pursue a career in acting. Right? Yeah. Very, very interesting. If you had to name one person so far who really gave you a leg up in your career. Uh, Jeff Howell changed my life. Bada bing. And, and I'm going to throw Ivy Eisenberg in there as well for, for two different reasons. Um, so when I was talking about starting to take my VO career seriously. Mm -hmm. It came from a realization all of a sudden, like just in a flash one day, I was like, I got my BFA in acting. I go to acting classes. I continue to train as an actor. I've been working in voiceover for 10 years and I've never studied it for a second. I mean, I had elocution lessons when I was a kid. Elocution. Yes. My mother was very insistent on diction. You know, I, I worked in the theater, so I knew about projection and vocal control and things like that. And I had done a lot of cold reading for a lot of different reasons. But it was this moment where I was like, what would happen if I actually trained for this the way I trained for all the rest of my career? And Jeff Hell changed my world, both with helping me tune my ear Mm-hmm. That was the biggest thing. He's like, these skills are there, but let's let me help you teach you how to listen differently. And he introduced me to uh, my agents over at Atlas, yeah. and and that changed my career forever. Um, new opportunities and and 
a new faith in me uh, shifted and it's been, I loved the people I was working with before. I had a great relationship, but it was, I'm sure that it was, you know, a little bit of cause and effect, you know, I'm taking it seriously and I shifted someplace else at the same time. Sure. I'm sure it's, you know, it's both of those things. Yeah. Um, but that was incredible. And he's an amazing coach and he was, he really got me, which was really helpful. Um, and Ivy Eisenberg is a, a casting director who I had met on one of the times they were trying to turn Legally Blonde into a TV show. And I kept going back and kept going back and never did get the job. And for Was this an on-camera thing? An or? on-camera okay. thing. <laughs> okay. And for, I want to say, eight or nine years, she kept bringing me in for on-camera auditions and things would go great, but the job never became my job. And, you know, and then one day... I got a call to go in on a video game and I was like, oh, I know Ivy. And that was my first Call of Duty job, which opened up the opportunity to audition for Black Ops 3, which was the game that changed my interactive career forever. Getting to do motion capture and performance capture and voice and be a lead female in a major AAA game and work on it for a year and the process of sustaining that and creating it and maintaining it all at the same time. I mean, those two people have in different ways, but changed my career forever. And I'm so grateful. I love that story that, that Ivy Eisenberg just kept bringing you in. And, and, it, and it's test. It's really a testament to the fact that when you go in an audition, you're not really auditioning for that part. You're auditioning mm-hmm. for the part that's way down the road. And, and, and if the casting director likes you and you do good work, it's a very, it's a very narrow parameter of what's going to fit that particular role. And it's kind of miraculous that anybody yeah. is booked, right? But it's just proof that she likes you. She brings you back. She likes you. She brings you back until something hits. Well, and if yeah. there's one thing to say to the people who are just getting started, it was 10 years or so. Right. You know, Elle Woods has very little in common with Rachel Kane. My, like, CIA director super soldier has very little in common with, you know, a bright and bubbly law student. But you got to stick around. Yeah. You got to stick around and keep going and know that no to this part doesn't mean no to you. It just means no to this part. And the people who got those jobs in between were the right people for those things. But you stick around and you stay wholehearted and you stay available and you keep showing up. And then the thing that is yours is the thing that is yours. Right. And which will not be yours if you, if you stop. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. will never be yours if and you don't keep showing up. And there's that selfish, greedy part that's like, no, everybody else go home. Oh everybody God. else leave I it to us. This is so part. fun. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah you got to stick around. Yeah. You just, you got to. You got to keep showing up because I love the way you said it, that it's, it's not the audition for this job. It's the audition for this path. Yeah. And you got to keep going yeah. in that direction. Yeah. It's really true. I mean, I auditioned many, many times as have every single <laughs> woman that I know in voiceover mm-hmm. auditioned for stuff for stars network. You know, we, sure. we read for those things all the time. And I want to say I auditioned for them for seven years before I finally booked a, you know, a series do, doing the, you know, it was a, a limited yeah. series. So, uh, but, but I looked at it and I, th- it just made me realize they've been hearing me all along Yeah, and it's just, the show hasn't been right. And this show was right. And so you know. here's one, the, f- the first cartoon I ever knew that I was in the running for, because there's so much about voiceover that's so wonderful. But one of the hard things is sometimes you don't know that you were on the short list because you, you just never get that know. call. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, in fact, the only time, come to think of it, that I've ever been into the studio, I got called in um, to go into Nickelodeon Studios to read in person in the final round for a role on a cartoon that I still desperately wish I could have been a part of because it was amazing. And I didn't audition for it. Oh. What she said when I walked in the room was, I know you didn't submit on this one, but I've heard your stuff and I've been hearing it and I think that you might be great for this. So all the other jobs that not only did I not get, but the one I didn't audition for still all, you know, it had potential to be mine. It didn't, it didn't become mine, but it had potential to be mine because it turns out she'd been hearing me all that time. We just hadn't met yet. Right. And I didn't know. So all those times where you, where you send that thing away and then you just kind of, you know, blow a kiss into the wind and go, yeah, I hope you never know where that thing is going to go. You never know who's going to hear it. And it may go so much farther than you ever have any understanding, but you've got to stick around yeah. to see what it's going to become. Yeah. 
It's a great takeaway for this podcast. I'll tell you, <laughs> you know, that you have to, you have to stick around. Yeah. Yeah, you really do. I want to swing back to your role as Jules yeah. in Hullabaloo. So tell me about it and tell me about the, the, the Indiegogo campaign that, 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 that funded this. So credit first to the artists. I came in as actors often do at the end after, you know, the big work had been done, but, um, there was, I believe it started with one and then it became a handful of Disney animators who just wanted to do a hand animated cartoon again, they, or not even again, because it's, it just doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, those pictures that we used to see of like, you flip the cell and you flip the cell and you add a line yeah. and you flip the cell and, you know, they wanted to do that. And it's such beautiful art and it, it isn't is. being done now that, uh, they decided to do an Indiegogo campaign to fund one short and it was so successful. I think they got seven or eight hundred percent of what they were asking for. So they were able to do seven. And even cooler than being a part of a hand animated cartoon is that the central roles are women. They're young girls who are interested in science and adventure. It's this the art is stunning. It's this steampunk world with a with a, a kind of a time travel angle. And I'm the modern friend who is thrown into the mix and just kind of goes, all right, let me, let me saddle up with you. Yeah. So it puts a little more punk in the steampunk for me with Jules and the art is so beautiful. And I just feel so lucky to get to be a part of it. And what's the, what's the plan for it? It's not, it's not on the air right now, right? No, I'm, I believe the plan is for it to be released, uh, online. Okay. Um, I'm certain that I really should have done my homework. I'm certain that some of the, the sort I'm looking for the gifts that you, that you get if you, if you sponsored it is probably yeah, yeah. access mm-hmm. to it. Um, but I believe that the intention is to, to release it online. There may be, um, I hope knocking on wood that there will be a great portal to, to put it on, but it was just, it's just one of those little projects that, um, I got called in by a, a friend of a friend who's like, I think that this might be a great fit for you. And I was going to ask you how you how you happened upon the role. Yeah, it was it was Keith and Val Aram have been incredible uh, friends to me. Um, uh, again, you got to stick around. I met Val at a workshop, and it was three years later, I think, that I got to go in and and do a gig at their studio. Mm-hmm. And she was like, Oh yeah, you. We met that time, and now I've gotten to do a number of things with them, which has been amazing. But she thought of me and, and, uh, or maybe Keith, I can't remember which of the two of them, but they're both so great. They thought of me and, and said, Hey, can you send in something for this? It's just this little project almost with this, almost with this feeling of like, can you help us out? (laughs) And I was like, this is the kind of thing I would do for free. And I would, I would pay for the studio time to do it. Cause it's just, it's, it's the kind of thing that if I have a daughter, I want my daughter to be able to see. And it's the kind of art that I want to be able to see. And it's just beautiful storytelling. And they're, they think they're three or four minute shorts. And I'm, I'm as excited as any fan to get to see them because they just look so cool. It's great yeah. it's, to be a part of such a collaborative effort yeah. and, and people do it because they love it. Yeah. Because they, they aspire to something like, I mean, you know, hand, hand animating is a, it's a, it's obviously not a lost art, but it's not one that's typically engaged these well, days. And one of the things that I learned on Justice League Action that I did not fully appreciate before is how long even digital animation takes. Yes. Oh my it takes months and months, up to a year for some of our 15-minute episodes. So the time and the investment and the love that has to go into hand animating something, I have a whole new appreciation for in a way that, that you just couldn't yeah. you know, otherwise. And and that it's somebody's passion project and that they were like, they're like, I love the work I do, but I want to get fired up by something that speaks to my heart. I love getting to be a part of that. Yeah. That's, that's such a gift. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. We're coming to the end of our time together, yeah, right. my love. So I want to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you the questions from the actor's studio with oh. James Lipton, right? Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. So fun. I always watched that show and thought to myself that no one would ever ask voice actors these questions, oh, you know? Yeah. And then I was like, I, I'm gonna. I love it. <laughs> so I hope I'm not breaking any copyright laws. I don't think I am. <laughs> you know what? If it is, it's Proust. So I think we've got some time. I okay. think it's okay. Okay, good. <laughs> is that who it is? Yeah. Who these questions are? I Because I was like, James Lipton stole it from somebody else. Yeah. So I'm just stealing it for him. It's great. So it's all it. good. Yeah. Creative thievery. That's what we're engaged in here. What is your favorite word? I love the word spork. It's just so much fun to say, and it's so visually evocative. And it's so accurate. Right? 
It is that I thing. Sport. Sport. <laughs> What's your least favorite word? Naked. Oh, ooh, naked, naked. Oh, good. Now, are you oh. saying naked? Because naked, not naked. I love you, mother. That is how my mom says it, and it makes me cringe every time. So it's the way the word naked. is spoken, naked, as opposed to naked, which is a lovely word. Okay, so I just want to, <laughs> I just want to yeah, make no. it like, mm-hmm. is that how you say naked? And you don't like the word naked, or you really don't like naked? Naked. Okay. Now I'm <laughs> okay. So you don't, you don't like. Uh, you don't like naked. Uh, what turned you on? Creativity. What turned you off? Bigotry. What sound or noise do you love? Rain on concrete. We had some rain oh, in the so earlier part of this soothing. podcast, in case you wanted to know what that sound was. What sound or noise do you hate? The sound of my alarm clock in high school that somehow is the sound that they always put on alarms in movies, and it gives me a heart attack every time. <laughs> Can you describe that sound? It's that. Oh, it's oh, that one. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so the awful. worst. Yeah. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? I loved working in fitness. What profession would you not like to do? Uh, I was a paralegal one summer, and it gave me so much anxiety, too much paper. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome. Rachel Kimsey, thank you so much for being here. Tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Rachel Kimsey, so I'm easy to find. All of them are Rachel Kimsey. Mm -hmm. K-I-M-S-E-Y. Fantastic. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for joining me today in The Beehive. Visit the podcast website, thebeehivepodcast.com, for pictures and more information on my guests. Find me at my website, kbest.com. Follow me on Twitter, at kbest, on Facebook, at kbest voiceover, and search my name on Instagram. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and good for the bones. Come back for more Women in Voiceover next time in The Beehive.